Thank you. Well, we can get started. So, yep, hello, I'm Carl, and I will be talking to you a bit about Rust and networking. I was going to open with a joke, but I learned that the talks were rated, so I'll skip that. Um, so, who here knows, has used Rust maybe? How about that? Has written anything with Rust? All right. So, there's already a good amount, a good number of you, and anyone here has never heard about Rust at all? Yeah. It's growing. We're growing. All right. So I actually got started um, writing with, uh, get, oh, I got started with Rust when I had my first kit. This is number two. Sorry. I didn't specify. But I was spending a lot of time up at night, not sleeping. And I was like, I should do something with this time. You know, just holding a small child. I, I could use my laptop to multitask. And I was like, all right, I'm sleep deprived. Let's write a distributed database. Why, why not? Spoiler alert, it never happened. But um, before I, like, I was going to get started, like, like all good engineers, I was like, let's bike shed the language. Uh, up to this point in my career, I, was, I started with Ruby. And I kind of got into writing a lot of Java and using JVM-based languages. Uh, so, so I thought I'd take some time and kind of do a survey of what other modern databases used. And what I learned surprised me. No. Um, turns out a lot of newer projects opt for languages that include a runtime. And by runtime, I, I mean a fairly heavy one, like Java has a virtual machine, comes with a JIT, Go has a garbage collector, it has a scheduler, it does stack growth. Anyway, Ruby and all these other more dynamic languages come with uh, like a, basically virtual machines or interpreters as well. And these runtimes, when they're called runtimes because they run logic at runtime, <laughs> when the process is running. And this logic that they have to run takes, like, takes away some performance from the language. And when you think of a database, you might be like, OK, we, this is something that we want to have as much performance as possible. Okay. So the fact that these languages are picked more often than not is a bit surprising. But what is the alternative? Like kind of historically, the more traditional answer is C or C++. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that. Um, it's those languages have been around for quite a long time. They don't come with a runtime. Like they come technically with a very very small runtime, but it doesn't matter for this. Uh, but when you use C or C++, memory management becomes your job. Just do it live. And by memory management, I mean allocating your memory so that you have somewhere to store data, making, get, tracking your references to it, making sure you free it the right spot. When you free it, of course, it gets reclaimed. And it's your job to make sure you do you know, just small things like never access it again afterwards. Uh, and, and that's hard enough in of itself. If you throw in threads or concurrency, you know, try to access data from multiple threads, it gets a little bit more complicated. Now, what happens when you get it wrong? Well, has anyone had a debug any, like something like this in production? Yeah? Yeah? Well, it's not fun, but that's also the best case scenario. Like, if you get a seg V, you should be like, thank goodness, because if you don't get the seg V, your process keeps running, doing its thing but not really doing it right. You know, maybe it's exposing some secrets to the world, things that you don't want outside world to know. But um, that's just kind of you know, the way it is when you use C or C++. You know, as long as you don't make mistakes, everything's OK. But people make mistakes. Like, I definitely have written a bug or two in my life. Uh, I, maybe I'm the only one, but I don't, I don't think so. But you ask some kind of users of C or C++, like really experienced, they've using, been using it for years, and they're like, some answers might be, well, it's actually not that hard when you use the right subset of the language. You might have heard that. It's like, it it's actually works pretty well. Of course, then you ask different people what that subset is. You might get different answers. Or you might get answers like, oh, it's, it's true, but you can just use linting tools. Right? Those will catch your bugs. Well, there are linting tools, and they work pretty well, but they're not infallible. And really, it just kind of takes like one or two bugs to end up with uh, pretty, like not some great 
situations like that. So I get like, historically, this is kind of the trade-off that you have to make um, when picking a language. On one hand, you have speed of C and C++, but you lose the safety that a runtime, especially the garbage collector part of a runtime, will give you. Because the garbage collector, when you run that, it manages the memory for you. When you, you just ask, say, hey, store this data for me, give me references, and the garbage collector at runtime tracks all those references and will keep the memory around for you until it deems that that memory can't be accessed anymore. That just takes some runtime costs. So enter Rust. Rust is a pretty new language at this point. It's hit, I guess, 1.0 1 maybe, what was it, three, three years in, uh, go and change. So it came out of Mozilla Research, and it builds itself as a systems programming language. And systems programming language means different things to different people. But like, I kind of go by, if you can write an operating system, if you can write device drivers, if you can take, write something in that language and embed it in Ruby or other languages, that, that's kind of what makes a systems programming language. And to achieve this, it cannot have a run, it cannot have a garbage collector, it cannot really do any stack management, it can't do any of these things that Java or Go would do. But the big thing about it, the kind of the, the new, uh, the, the big new feature that it brings to the table is that it offers all of, um, like, it does all of this without the runtime, but it still guarantees memory safety. So the bugs around like accessing uninitialized memory, et cetera, et cetera, from C or C++. If you're, you write a program in Rust and it compiles, it's guaranteed to not have any of those bugs. And basically, now that trade-off, you don't have to make anymore. You're like, OK, I can get speed and safety with Rust. And that's, that's a pretty big deal, especially for someone like me, I came, you know, I didn't, I grew, like I grew up, um, I grew up, like I started programming in Ruby, I didn't really have any formal programming education. Um, I've always before been kind of afraid of getting really deep down in the systems level, because I'm like, I'm gonna mess it up. Uh, it just, using Rust makes it a bit more approachable, because you don't have to worry about those kinds of problems anymore. It's, it just makes it easier and more approachable. So. Because it doesn't have any of the runtime, it, and it still guarantees the memory safety, it has to do this by um, checking the program at compile time. So it's not, it's kind of like a linter, but it's um, stronger in that it just won't compile if it can't guarantee the safety. And the way it does that is um, what it calls ownership. It's a bundle of features, but roughly, um, it's, it's like the Rust memory model, right? So, like garbage collected, it might be a memory model, but for us, it's ownership. And it's able to, by using this model, track memory that's allocated, whether it's the heap or the stack or whatever. And similar, and similar to, I guess, uh, garbage collector, you can have multiple references to that memory. And when all the references go out of scope or are gone, and that data is not accessible anymore, Rust is able to clean it up for you, but it does that at compile time. So the way it works, it starts off by saying data has one owner. So when you allocate a piece of memory, like a string or something, and you assign it to a variable, that like variable is the owner of that string. And there can only be at one time one owner. So quick little code example. Allocate the string, assign it to foo. So foo's the owner. Now foo's assigned to bar. Bar is now the owner. Foo has handed off ownership. It can't access string anymore, that string anymore. And then we're just going to print that um, string. It passes, the, very, the string gets passed into the function, and ownership gets transferred into the function. Then you use it. So because from that string function, like the, the string, once uh, the function returns, that string is no longer accessible, Rust knows, OK, I'm going to inject the free at that point. When the function returns, the string is free. And now, if you do something not, like if you violate the, uh, like the requirements of Rust, so here we set create a string, assign it to foo, and then again, assign foo to bar, but now I'm trying to pass foo into the function. Now foo gave up ownership. It can't act, use that string anymore. The compiler is going to complain. It's going to say, oh, no, sorry. Pretty helpful message, actually. So that's kind of the 
main, like build, the first building block of Rust and ownership. Now, using, like only being able to access memory through a single variable is not, uh, will, is not, it's a bit limiting, limiting. So there are other ways, like there's ways to get more references to a single piece of memory. But in the way, it's called borrowing data. So there's still a, like an owner, a single owner that owns that data, but you, um, other kind of code locations, like other variables can borrow the data. And that's, to borrow, they'll get a reference, just like a pointer, but instead of, um, but, but, so two pointers will point up. So the pointer will point to the data, and the owner will still have access to it. But the requirement is that at compile time, Rust can ensure that the, uh, the reference, so the, the reference to the, that is borrowing the data, goes out of scope before the owner does. So in other words, at compile time, Rust has to ensure that all references to the piece of data go out of scope before that data is free, so before the owner goes out of scope. Um, so again, a similar example, but this time that ampersand foo gets a reference. So by doing that, foo still owns the string, bar borrows the string, and you see the print function now takes a reference. So you can pass in foo and you can pass in bar, and you still can use, um, the string is still owned by foo, and foo's gonna go out of scope here, but foo, but the compiler knows that when foo goes out of scope, all the references are gone. It does that statically. Now, here I'm just gonna add a little drop. It's kind of a small function that just does ex like explicit freeing, and all it does is just takes a piece of data and does nothing with it. So it takes data by ownership, does nothing with it, Russ injects a uh, free right when drop returns. So now foo is the owner still, and we have some references, like bar references it, but now we're trying to pass foo into the drop function, and that would cause the owner, foo, to go away while they're still outstanding references. And this would be, like, if this could compile, that would give you some use after free, a use after free bugs, but the Rust compiler prevents it. <clears throat> now these references are all immutable. That means that if you get a immutable reference, you can read the data, but you can't write to it. Now, Sometimes it's also useful to be able to mutate data. So there's, a, uh, there's an equivalent kind of, you can get mutable references. Now, the difference, so in order for the ownership system to work, there are a few um, requirements. So one is one owner. You can have as many immutable references to that data as you want, as long as, the, as, long as um, all the references go out of scope before the owner does. And you can only have one single mutable reference to a piece of data at any given time, as long as the reference goes away before the um, owner goes out of scope. And you, if you have a, a mutable reference, you cannot have any immutable references. All right, so those are the rules. If you can get that, you're good. So if we're trying to do the exact same thing that we did with mutable, uh, immutable references, but now I switch it to mute, and it doesn't work, because that would violate the rules. Now, Here's like a more complicated or like example. Like here, we're creating a vector. So a vector is just like a global array. We can push a string into it. Then a bunch of code, like let's say it's a really big function. Val takes a uh, reference, an immutable reference to the first entry in the um, vector. And then later we try to push a new string into the vector. So in order to push, that's gonna require mutating the vector. So that's gonna require um, a single, like to get a mutable reference. But because your val actually holds an immutable reference to the vector, and this isn't going to compile. And this, anyone, and you know, if you're just looking at this, you might think, like, oh, well, I don't see why that's, it would be bad to do this. I'm not actually touching the like, value. Why can't I push into the vector? Does anyone can imagine what might happen? Why is it prevented? It's okay. So, I mean, like the vector, when you push new value, it might internally reallocate storage. So there has to be memory inside the vector to store the values. And since it's growable, it might start with like a small, small amount of memory, and then you push in a value, and that's going to move all of the existing values into a larger chunk of memory. So 
pushing could cause the memory of all elements, like all the values in, within the vector to move. And if you have a reference to one of these values, that's going to end up being a dead reference because the actual data gets moved. So if you did this in C or C++, you would end up with a lovely use after, well, access uninitialized memory, use after free. Um, and, but Rust doesn't let you do that. It's like, OK, don't do this. This is bad. All right. So next, you're like, the, that's the ownership system. All those are the checks that the compiler does um, at compile time. And once, if you only use borrowing in like the ownership system, the, result, the resulting program will have no like runtime cost. All the guarantees have been done at compile time. Now, the, you can get a lot done with, within those constraints. But sometimes, like, you do get into situations where you need to move beyond, like, you have to do something that the, that the ownership system wouldn't let you do out of the box. So let's say you just simply have the requirement of you want a piece of data and you want two references to it, but you can't, act, you can't statically determine which, like, reference is going to outlive the other. So because there can only be one owner and references have to be shorter lived at compile time, that um, this, you would not be able to represent two references with, they'll get freed at a runtime kind of point. So you don't have, if you hit cases like that, you don't have to be like, all right, well, nothing works anymore. I'm just going to go back to un everything being unsafe. What you can do is you build like a small abstraction that encompasses like, that, that lets you do what you need to do. And the implementation might be a little unsafe, but it provides a safe API, and it can leverage um, a number of the like Rust capabilities to just be able to provide like an API that's going to be safe to the user. So in this case, this is a reference counted cell. Reference counting is just like you you count the number of references to it, and when the number of references go down to zero, the data gets free. And there we just create a new one. We get a first reference clone it, get a second one. So drop here drops the reference. It doesn't drop the data. So the first reference goes out, and then we can still access the second one. So the main point is this, you, like, there are, um, like you can get around the limitations of the borrow checker by using these kinds of primitives. Now, how would you implement that? This is just like a little quick snippet, but Clone, like it just increments the ref count. So the star mut is a unsafe pointer. It's basically the equivalent, the equivalent of what a C pointer would be, just completely no guarantees at all. And to access it, you have to wrap your code with a unsafe block. So when you wrap code with unsafe block, you're saying, don't check any of this compiler, because you are not going to be able to. Um, but the point is, like here, like because Rust strong ownership and the fact that it can tell when data gets dropped exactly, you're able to write a little hook that says when the RC handle gets dropped, run this little bit of code. So you, as the user of the API, you don't have to manually increment and decrement references. You just use the data, and once the reference goes out of scope, it's able to track it and eventually clear it. And the li standard library comes with a number of these containers. And just utilities to work around limitations. Honestly, like with just the standard library and the base, the ownership rules, you can write basically anything. So when you're getting started with Rust, sometimes it feels a little bit like this. It's actually a little bit frustrating to get started, started because you think either like you might come from a background where you really think you know what you're doing, and you're like, ah, why don't you just let me compile it? But in my experience. Nine times out of ten, I was the one that was wrong. Probably because I came from a garbage collected um, background and I didn't really know what I was doing, but it was definitely a little bit of a frustrating experience. So my warning is like, at first, if you try it, it might be a little frustrating, but then you build up an intuition and the borrow checker gets out of your way. You kind of know how to, out of the box, how to structure your code to make it happy. And Rust gets you features beyond just basic memory management, because the ownership model can be used, like, kind of like, like, kind of like what I hinted, uh, to, strut, to design APIs that are safe to use, that prevent you from writing like, bugs that you might otherwise even write in a language like Java or Go. And this works out particularly well with concurrency, because most data race problems are, are data problems. Like, who, like what thread owns the data? Like, are you coordinating access? To the, like, do you have multiple references? So 
quick example, you have a channel. A channel is just a queue, like a, a way to send messages. It's like Go has channels. It's the exact same thing. Um, basic t, uh, TX is the transmit side, RX receive. There we move the receive to another thread, and then we're sending the message. But because it's Rust, when you send the message, you're passing ownership of that data into the channel. And you're not allowed to use it after you do that. And if you did use it, while in Java or whatnot, it would not be memory unsafe in that you won't access uninitialized memory, but you will get into concurrency bugs, which can be very fun to debug. And then new taxes also leverage the ownership system. Uh, usually when you use a new text in like other languages, you're protecting, you're guarding um, code sections. But so you, you say, OK, this is my critical section. I'm going to lock above. I'm going to unlock below. And it can be a little error prone. With Rust, instead, you guard data. So we put some data that we want to protect. We put it in a mutex. And the arc is just a, an atomic reference counted cell. So it's the same as RC. It just works. It uses atomics internally. So it works across threads. And there, what, when you call lock, mutex.lock, that returns a value called a guard. And that value is how you can access the data inside. And the, the tick A is how it references a lifetime, a bit beyond the scope. But basically, guard is, is a wrapped reference to the internal data. But because it's a value and you can implement drop handles, right? you can say, when guard goes out of scope, run this code, you can move the unlock functionality into the drop of the guard. So all you do is you just lock, you get the guard, you use it as if it was just a regular pointer to the data, and then you forget, it, forget about it. You don't need to worry about unlocking. It just is done for you. Now, it's like Rust has a ton of other like, language features. They're, it's a pretty nice language, but again, ownership is the kind of the main reason for Rust. And this is Rust's mission statement, like fast, reliable, productive. And that's, it's a pretty lofty goal. Can, like the Rust developers are trying to, one, give you a language that doesn't ever compromise on performance, while at the same time, um, not allowing you to write, uh, let you write as few bugs as possible and without getting in your way. So it's trying to be as productive as possible. It's, it's a tough order. So my, so I, again, like I started Rust, uh, started using Rust four years ago um, to trying to write, I was like, all right, I'm gonna write my distributed database. I'm going to use Rust. And when I got started, there was like, there's basically no ecosystem at all. So like, most people, like my decisions probably should have been like, this is a cool language, you know, but I'll wait for, <laughs> I'll wait for it to mature a bit. Like, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to do anything real, so I was like, all right, yak shave time. We're gonna get down and implement the world. All right, and I've, I'm still working on that. I haven't actually gotten out back to the database part yet, so maybe, maybe for kid number two, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I was like, all right, it's an opportunity to start working on a networking library for Rust called Tokyo. And it's also an opportunity to be like, okay, I have used plenty of other non-blocking asynchronous or like event-driven, like all the buzzwords libraries, right? And there are a lot of great ones out there. There are like really like lots of great ones out there. Um, but when writing one, a new one, you get to re, like revisit every single decision <laughs> they make. Why not? Um, and it wasn't just like because I, they were all bad and I was going to make it so much better. It's also because Rust, with, the, with its functionality and its new features and its ownership system, actually changes the trade-offs that you make when designing a library. So you can use, because you can use the, the, like the ownership system to add like lots of kind of, to design your API to be more, um, like, I guess, defensive for the, for the end user, there's like a lot of decisions that change. And that's also how I got um, involved with Buoyant. I started working in Tokyo, and Buoyant's makers of Linkerd and Conduit. I don't know if you're familiar with the whole service mesh thing. I was not familiar before I started, but so rough, roughly a service mesh is like you have all your microservices, which are very hot these days, um, and now you got like you solve the monolith problem, but it's like now you have other problems. Like, 
I've, I've not managed um, a, a microservice situation myself, but I hear it can be tricky. Um, so the service mesh, right, it integrates with Kubernetes, so it's basically a very fancy proxy. I just think it has a very fancy proxy that sits in your pod, which are terms I'm not super familiar with, but the point is like every single, ser like every single um, server is gonna have to run an instance of this proxy. And Buoyant started first, like way back even before Rust um, really picked up, they were like, we're gonna write a service mesh. They did the exact same, like, they went through the exact same situation, uh, like set of questions, like do we go with Java, Java or JVM, or do we go with like C or C++, but because it's, um, like the proxy touches every single bit of customer data, essentially, they ended up starting with Java, well, actually Scala for um, Linkerd. But it has all, like, if you're gonna run like a proxy on every single one of your servers with Java, Java's not known for being lightweight, like it, it's fast, it's plenty fast, but getting your memory over, <laughs> the memory uh, of a Java process down is definitely a challenge. Um, so Linkerd initially was not designed to be run on every single server because of the memory requirement. The idea was like you had a few large servers, you ran really big Linkerd processes, and from the, your app, on a, like in a pod, you talked out, out of there. Now, that wasn't like, if you do that, you now are t uh, making a network hop instead of talking locally, which isn't great. So Boyne was like, all right, let's reevaluate what we can do. Like, let's write a new piece of software, Conduit, that now is written in Rust. So it's, it has, the proxy part is written in Rust, and they're, when they decided to make that change, they're like, all right, we, Tokyo's around now, and now I work there. I work um, at Boyance, working on Tokyo. So, and I think it like, turned out pretty well. I'm gonna make a very bold claim. I think, I'm gonna say Tokyo is the fastest, safest networking library out there. Star that uses, um, operating system sockets, like, so it doesn't use user land sockets anyway, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not gonna back this up with benchmarks. Why would I do that? I'm going to use, <laughs> why would I, like, yeah, no reason to. But I'm gonna still make that claim. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to make an argument for it, because like, in benchmarks you can fake, it's, and it, it is pretty fast. So as uh, the library like, provides everything you would expect from such a library, like epoll, kq, backed, uh, backed IO, timers, et cetera, et cetera, so it, uses, it has, um, task scheduling, anyway, that's not, it's all the stuff that everyone else provides too. What, uh, one cool thing is though is, the way, Tokyo's not actually a big library, it's actually a whole set of smaller libraries, and you can, every one of these pieces can be standalone, or you can mix and match, so, for example, if you did want to take like, um, user land uh, sockets, and you could just take, like wrap, I don't know, what was it, um, it's not PK, it's the other one, it's DPDK, right? All right, you could just like wrap that, and then use everything else that Tokyo provides. But two things I think Tokyo does really well, like way better than anything else besides being fast and safe, um, is it handles cancellation and back pressure really well. So cancellations, like let's say you issue an HTTP request, like under the hood that HTTP request is going to like, maybe it spawns multiple connections because it's like, okay, let's, let's see which endpoint is actually faster. So it tries to connect to two, two different endpoints and requires DNS queries to like look at, like resolve the host name, et cetera, et cetera. There's basically a lot of work that might go on just making HTTP requests. Cancellation is like, oh, if you decide that you don't need the response anymore, you, how do you stop all that work from happening? Because in an asynchronous world, you, it's all happening like somewhere in the background, somewhere. Like, canceling that work is historically hard. And back pressure, now that for, to explain that, I defer to wiser people. So <laughs> back pressure is the problem of, like, you are a process that processes water bottles, and you are stalled, go to sleep, and the flight attendant, they're just, they just generate water bottles for you, right? But you're asleep, you can't drink the water anymore, and the flight attendant just keeps giving you water bottles, and they just build up, and now you have to deal with these water bottles. Water, sub water bottles with um, data and memory, it's just, it's basically queues filling up, and how do you deal with that? So these are the two problems that I think Tokyo handles really well, and I'll explain a bit later how it does it. So, but the secrets to it being super fast and super is basically to do no work. Now, 
we already know like Rust is a fast language. I already explained that. Um, but if the library is terrible, it doesn't matter how fast Rust is, it's, the, the, it's not going to be fast, right? So the way Tokyo is structured, it's trying to take the idea of like uh, uh, Rust ideas of like how can you provide abstractions that under the hood basically do no additional work over what you would write by hand. So the way, like the, the benchmark is, what if you wrote an equivalent like networking process direct, handwritten directly with EPOL? And so that is like if you didn't use the abstraction. And when you use Tokyo, the end result, once it gets compiled down, is going to be equivalent to what you would get if you hand wrote it. So just a quick like snippet of what it's like maybe to use Tokyo. Right? So doesn't like the details don't matter too much, but the point is like here it's it's pretty high level, right? It looks like you're just binding, you loop over connections, you like the copy is just gonna copy data from one socket to the other. Then you spawn tasks. So spawn is like just like spawning in Go or Erlang. It's like you build up these little tasks and you submit them to some executor to run in the background. Right? So and the argument is when you write something like this, when it compiles down, it's gonna be equivalent to handwriting a state machine with equal. So the kind of the way Tokyo structures like manages the asynchronicity and the like the programming model is based on futures. And futures aren't a new idea. Like every single language has them. Um, it's a future is a value that represents like a computation. So you have a computation going off in the background. The future you, is a value they get immediately that represents the completion of that um, computation and getting the end result. If that doesn't make any sense, futures are basically monads. I think. I hope. Hopefully that clears it up. Um, but the main, again, the main point is you, t let's say TCP connects, that's going to start an asynchronous process because uh, it uses non-blocking sockets. So you, the function's going to return, and but the socket's not going to be connected. But you'll get event, you'll immediately get a future representing that com that socket that connected. And when you get that, you can then chain up more computations. So you can just be like. OK, and then do something with a socket, and then do something else, et cetera. So it's instead of um, kind of having to hand write state machines, you can write your code more synchronous. Like the code itself can be ordered in the sequence that you want the operations to be. And you can do more than just uh, sequential, like chaining off sequential. Like here, these two copy future one, future two, they're going to happen like concurrently or in parallel. I'm not the type of person that splits hairs. Um, and then you join them. So join takes those two futures and returns a new future that completes when those two complete, like the original two complete. So the future one, future two will run in parallel, and future three completes when both of them are done. And if Tokyo is going to be a zero cost abstraction, so not at any runtime cost uh, over what you do by hand, futures have to be as well. So first, let's quick go in really fast. Let's see roughly what EPOL, what it would be like to write the state machine with EPOL, because that is my argument is going to end up being the same. Uh, EPOL is roughly two like two things working together. Like you have non-blocking sockets, so you need your generally your socket, but it, they're non-blocking. So when you do a read, if there's no data that is ready to be read, the function returns immediately. It doesn't block compared to synchronous sockets that will block the thread until data arrives. But you could then, like, just in a loop, continuously try to read, like read not ready, read not ready, read not ready. That would just spin and burn all your CPU. So there's the second component is you have an event queue. So that is the you pull events off of this queue, and when a socket receives data, it will tell you, okay, hey, this socket's ready, and then you know, okay, this socket received data. Now I can try to read again. So you get events from the operating system. And then you respond to those events by trying to perform an operation. Now, here's a little bit of pseudocode. I would no way I could fit real code on the slide. Um, it just kind of shows the structure of how the application would be set up. You like set up the sockets, you register with ePoll, and you say, when the socket is ready, give me back token zero. Token is like whatever, like a pointer sized uh, bit of data, anything you want. And then you just like, so then you get the events and you say, okay, this event's ready, like this, I get this token and I match that with an action that I have to take. And you just do that in a loop over and over and over again. Now if you get um, 
if you want to implement a more com involved protocol, it gets a little bit <laughs> more complicated, right? So I can't, then again, pseudocode when you implement. But to, let's say you want to make do these steps, what you have to do is you, and it, you create an, some state to track, the, uh, you create some variable to track the state of your connection. This is just a Rust enumeration, so it just tracks like a value, a socket state's gonna be one of these potential values. And when you get an event from ePoll, you load up the so state of the socket, you're like, what state are you in? Okay, you're in this state, now I have to try to get you this next state. And you just do that in the loop again. But it's pretty painful, but if you do it, you get a lot of benefits. You could implement that protocol with no runtime allocations, no dynamic dispatch, et cetera. So after, comp after compiling, Tokyo is going to generate equivalent kind of runtime, uh, equivalent process. And it does that by having a completely different runtime model with futures than you might expect. So instead, usually futures are you push data through the system. With Tokyo, you're going to pull it. And it's a subtle difference. And I'm going to get into it a little bit. But at a high level, Tokyo futures look the same. Like you some, look like futures you might use from other languages. And this is actually a stumbling block for a lot of people coming in because they have this intuition of how it's going to run. And it does something, it runs in a completely different way. So that's my word of warning. So traditionally, this is what the socket's going to, like a future is going to look like. Um, this is the push model. So to do it, you have a future, you have to store the callback, you have to allocate the callback, and the computation that is running in the background is going to have um, a pointer to it a pointer to this future, and then the consumer is going to have a pointer to that future. And then there's a race of saying, okay, I got the computation's running, and I, the consumer's running. Is the consumer going to register the callback first? If it registers the callback first, it gets assigned there. Is the computation going to com like complete before the um, consumer registers the callback? So there's like, so the future itself has to be able to handle both of those like um, possible permutations in the runtime. And on top of what I didn't show, like you'll probably have to have some sort of like atomic states to make it work in multiple threads. It gets pretty involved. But then you have the future, you can chain up computations. And once you build up that chain of computations with your future, it's gonna run. So here's the drain socket future and all the callbacks. And at some point, like the computation's gonna finish and it's gonna be like, I got the final value, I'm gonna push it. So I'm gonna call the callbacks, I'm gonna push it down the system. And the value is going to just go through all the callbacks eagerly and get to the end. But the future has to hold on to it because at some point, another callback gets registered. Now, it gets the back pressure thing comes in if instead of returning one value, like, like the, the future I described, you have like a channel. So it's going to be many values are going to keep coming off, coming through the system, through the channel. But this time it gets hung up on the callback. And the value keeps getting pushed. The problem is the pushing part. So this can be resolved, like, R, like all these like Rx and other systems solve it by having a fairly involved API between the two, like the, essentially the callback and the channel saying, okay, I'm actually ready, oh, pause, oh, anyway, it gets involved. But with a pull-based system, instead of like storing callbacks or, or anything, so here, what it, so it's, while it's a future that represents the completion, with Tokyo, the future actually is the is the computation. So it's it stores all the every all the information that it needs to run the computation, and then when you try to pull a value out of it, that's what drives the computation. So here, this future just has the socket and stores the number val uh, read, and when you try to pull it pull the value, either it returns ready when the value can be. Ret uh, returned or it returns not ready saying the computation is not completed yet. So in this implementation, when you try to read, if you get zero, that means the socket closed and you're like, okay, I can finally get the final result of this future and you return it. So next, you, exactly the same API, that's like the same high level API for chaining computations. But again, unlike in the push model, these chain computations don't do anything until they're pulled. So this is what a, the then future will look like. And it's an enum of two different states. So I'm 
starting to get into like, okay, remember the, um, the enum to represent the state of the connection. Here you have this combinator it has the state of like, okay, I'm trying to run this first future. F is the callback. And you, when you run it, like you try to, you, it gets pulled. If it's in the first state, it tries to get the value out of it. And when, when it does successfully, it runs the callback and then it gets a future from the callback and then it updates itself saying, okay, now we're running the second half of the computation. So this layout is actually just a plain old struct. There's no allocations. It just contains, like, it's just uh, enum which just says either I'm in state A or state B. So the way this runs is you go, like, you start pulling. So it goes again through all the callbacks. And the pull, like, the then combinator or the then future then says, okay, now I've got to find my state. I pull my inner one. So now it pulls the next one. And it's actually just going up the nested stack until it gets to drain socket, and then drain socket says, all right, I am not ready yet, because I have not finished draining all the socket, and then it just returns not ready all the way back down. And at some point in the future, you say, and at some point in the future is a little hand wavy, but it gets called again when, when it's ready to try again. And this time, calls the, like, then calls the inner future, et cetera, et cetera, it goes up the stack, drain socket's gonna be ready, and that gets returned all the way back down. So because, so and remember drain socket held, actually ran the computation when it got pulled. So if you don't pull the future, no work happens. So because no work happens, it can't produce values. So in the channel example, again, you, let's say you pulled it, it per, uh, returned the value, this time the callback stalled. So the callback itself is waiting on a, some other computation. It, it holds the value in it, and then it just says not ready. But the next time you pull, the pull goes all the way up to that callback. That callback's now, it's not ready yet, so it's not going to try to call channel again. And because it doesn't pull channel, the, that work never happens, because the work only happens when you pull it. So by virtue of doing all that, you, you, just, you get back pressure handling for free, basically. All right, so like getting back to this was the original protocol that we were trying to implement. This is how you might write it up using futures. And once you compile it, it essentially it's going to be a bunch of, it's going to be, the type's going to look a lot crazier than this. It's going to be a whole bunch of nested uh, then callbacks, which are like two different enums, but it essentially is the same thing as this. And the same thing as EPL. <laughs> and that's why I say it's the fastest, basically, because it does no, no more work than it has to. So then there's the, there was the magic like, oh, at some point in the future, it gets pulled. Remember, like that was a little hand wavy. The answer to that is that root, that, that top level future represents the task. You spawn it, and then in the background, that, that starts, that's a, a crazy diagram, but it submits the task to the executor. And its job, the executor's job, is going to be to pull the future when, it's, when there's work to be done. Roughly, the way it happens, so remember, external events come in with ePoll. So ePoll gets the event. I call those like the drivers of the, like the, so the socket is like a resource. The ePoll is a driver. So it gets the uh, event from the operating system. It's going to say, hey, socket, you are ready to be operated on. The socket itself is going to know like, which executor it's on. So it's going to inform the executor, I'm ready to be read from. And it's, the executor then will be like, OK, so this task can be pulled. So the way a task, the way the executor determines the task needs to be pulled is if any of its resources like sockets become ready. So because the task is blocked on the socket to make further progress, once the socket transitions to ready, it can be pulled again. And the thing, the thing about the whole, like that whole graph, like the diagram I just showed in the previous slide and all the different components of Tokyo, like I said, they're loosely coupled. So this is like the full API of how everything fits together. Everything is um, basically loosely coupled and only connects via these two APIs. 
which lets you swap out your executor, swap out your like, timer, mix and match how you want. So basically, you use Rust, you get to have your, oh, you get to have your cake and eat it too. Um, high level like ergonomic language without sacrificing performance. And if you use Tokyo, Tokyo plus Rust gets you speed and safety for your network programming. And there we go. All right. So. All right. I think we have some time for questions. Uh, all right. I'll do start there and then go there. Hey, go ahead. Sorry, I'm not uh, super familiar with Rust. Does Rust have like uh, language support for futures, or is that just a library construct okay. that you've implemented? Yeah. So right now, um, it's the good thing about Rust because it's such a like systems language. You it doesn't you can basically implement anything directly in language. So right now, futures is a library. There's ongoing work to add some additional async await capabilities to the language, and at that point, um, that would require compiler support. So some of the, the a minimum amount of the futures library will have to move into the language itself, but you will still need the futures library to um, get the full set of capabilities. So basically right now it's a library a little bit with as async await a little bit will move in. So your examples had epol a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you support KQ, yeah, pull, I, select, all that? Yeah, I, it supports all of them, basically. KQ, IOCP, others. It's, there's a, I mean, there's an abstraction for it. Neo is actually the Rust abstraction over all of that. I just say epol because it's easier than a vendor-driven I.O. or whatever. Okay. And, so and it then, supports all of it, yeah. And then one other question. Uh, from a concurrency perspective, you're talking about um, the fact that you have it built in in uh, the, the task spawning from a Rust language perspective, is it truly concurrent? Is it truly like spanning cores and handling um, Well, so it's in the, at the uh, Tokyo spawn is a library thing, and it spawns it on an executor. The thing is that like, yes. The, so the answer is it de depends on the executor. Tokyo comes with two. It comes with a fully like M to N scheduler, so runs it across all cores, uses like uh, work stealing, a, the whole like nine yards. So it's pretty heavily inspired by like the Go and Erlang scheduler. So it's, on that front, it's not innovating. It's just copying what others do. Um, but if you don't want threading, you can also actually say, actually, I don't want to use this threaded executor. I'm going to use a single, thread ex a single threaded executor. Or you could say, I want to use a threaded one, but like keep them siloed. Like, so because you can mix and match the executor, you can use whichever one fits your use case. Um, so that's all uh, looks really good. I like the state machine stuff. But um, in the course of writing an application with Tokyo, how much do people actually have to write their own state machines? So r right now, a good amount. So the reason, OK. So the reason is, so, OK, let me start. So the problem is you want to be able to use borrows with Rust. But borrows are tied to the stack, right? It's you have to be able to guarantee that a borrow will outlive, uh, will not outlive the owner of the data. And that is pretty heavily based off of the stack. Um, once you go asynchronous, you lose the stack. So it gets a bit trickier. You can either, you can use all the combinators that I showed, but when you do that, you have to adopt a very functional style where you pass in all your state into each combinator and then return it. So if you like functional programming, you'd be like, this is great. Um, if you, don't, so the thing is that like, if you get into a more complicated situation where you need like, to implement a future that takes a route or does some borrowing or whatnot, that's when you have to like, take that little chunk of logic and write it by hand. So you have to implement the future that does that bit of logic, that state machine yourself. Um, but you don't have to write anything else. You can just compose it with the combinators like I showed. Um, it's definitely not as easy as it could be right now um, because it, you, again, you, loo, you are kind of working against a borrow checker, but this will be solved with async await. It's basically everyone is like, it's, all, this, all those problems go away with async await. It's not, it's a bit, um, it hasn't been released yet, so I'm not going to talk about it, but hopefully by the end of the year. Um, I was curious, in your opinion, when is Rust not a good choice to build your service with? Uh, well, never. 
No. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I would say like it's a lot of it's the ecosystem. So it's like, do you want to build a high level web app? Per, at that point, like r absolute max raw performance probably doesn't matter as much. There's less, and like there are some web frameworks, for example, but I would say th at that level, I probably wouldn't. Um, it, it's very use case specific. I would say you should never use C or C++. I'm just gonna like just make it that one black and white. But um, hopefully I don't offend anyone. But um, besides that, if you're picking between like a runtime language versus Rust, I mean there is. It depends, right? <laughs> like if you're at the low level, I would always use Rust. Like to write a proxy, to write a database. At this point, I just always use Rust. To write, the, to write a web service, like just simply because the ecosystem is there, probably not. And then past that, once there is ecosystem, you have to like decide, right? There's lots of other factors, like what do people already know in your company? But the answer is always use Rust. <laughs> right. I'm, I'll be right outside too, so.